<laughs> so yeah, all right, let's do this. Hi, people right. out there. Hi, people here. Thanks for coming. Um, so this is the fun session where we get to talk about Bach, which of course I would just do every session if uh, anybody <laughs> didn't object. So um, we call this lecture the grand duality for a couple of reasons. Think about this for a moment. With the well-tempered, we're always talking about preludes and fugues. Right? Think about how different that is from Chopin's preludes, for example, where you have 24 preludes in a slightly different order, but they're just preludes, no fugues, right? And you think, well, that's odd. Chopin wouldn't write fugues. And the one time he tried to do it, it was a gross failure. <laughs> yeah, we know. <laughs> However, what's the difference there? Well, that there's always in the well-tempered a causal relationship between the two halves, the prelude and the fugue. And since we only perceive music in a forward-moving direction because it's temporal, we don't hear things backwards or we're retrograde, the prelude must in every way case lead you towards the fugue. And the dialogue between the two is fascinating. We've talked a lot about how in past lectures you can make things like cyclic return at the end of your fugue to hint back to the beginning of the prelude, right? And that's, that's one method of kind of a circular hearing that is possible with this. But that's less possible when you just have one piece, i.e. just a prelude, right? I always find it very bizarre when you see pianists just perform preludes of the world well or just fugues. And it doesn't happen most of the time that they do both. But every once in a while you see this, and I'm like, why are you either playing half the piece or starting halfway through? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> because they're dependent on one another. And so usually, in, I don't know to put a percentage on it, but let's say a very high percentage of the preludes and fugues, the point of the prelude is to lead you into the fugue. And the fugue is the culmination of all the ideas of the prelude. Right? We see that almost all the time. Kachpal mode of manipulation in the prelude is such that it prepares the fugue subject. Or the metric play in the prelude pr kind of precedes what ends up being a highly metricized subject. All these things are common. Now, what's not common is the one we're going to talk about today, which is the E-flat major. If you know this piece, you know it's special for a lot of reasons. It, unlike all of the other preludes, remember there are 48 total, right? This is, this is E flat major, so it should be number seven. Okay. Um, it's going to be between C minor and E flat. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's understandable. Um, we've talked a little bit about the forms of the preludes, right? How they can be so many different things. They can be inventions. They can sonatas, they can be arias, you can have free lyric preludes, you can have species style preludes, all those things are doable. You can have toccatas. Um, it's one of the beauties of the word prelude is it really could be anything. And the same thing applies to the Chopin preludes or the Debussy preludes. Right? You look at them, is there any one form for any that applies to all of them? Of course not. But none of them do what this prelude does. It's the longest prelude by far of all the 48. Um, in time-wise, right, in actual real time. Some pianists played at about five minutes, which is very long for a prelude, right? I've seen some probably exaggerated ones at about six minutes. Of course, Glenn Gould plays at about two and a half. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't advise that. Um, but why is it so long? What's, what's happening? Well, as you, you probably either know or will see very soon, this prelude actually has a huge fugue in the, in the center of it, which is highly unusual. So instead of just having the dialectic between prelude and fugue being an A and B duality, we have inside the prelude a double fugue. So we have an A section, the toccata, which you see from measure one to nine. We have a fugato following that, which goes up until measure 24, 25. And then the entirety of the rest of this is an enormous double fugue with the two ideas put together. So, not only is this prelude a double fugue, but it's larger than any of the fugues of the well tempered as well. It's pretty amazing. And so what happens to this duality of always trying to move forward in time when the prelude itself so outweighs the fugue? The actual fugue that follows this prelude is very short and has led a lot of people to kind of poo-poo it. It's one of people's, if you're going to poo-poo something in Bach, which by the way you shouldn't do, but, <laughs> but if you're going to do that, this is an easy target. Because people say, you have a six and a half minute prelude that is so incredibly dense, and beautiful, and intricate. And then you have this, this actual fugue, which is like a minute and a half long of just, you know, kind of rambunctiousness. <laughs> what gives? It's odd, isn't it? Sometimes I, I think back to the, uh, the whole golden mean thing when I was 
that everybody loves to talk about. And it's like, it's one of those great unprovable things in life. It always seems like it's kind of true, but it's, is it? You know, there's a great book that I'd refer everybody to uh, by one of my good friends, Ms. Codgis and Roy Howitt. Uh, he wrote a book called Debbie C. In Proportion. Absolutely fascinating. And it just talks about gold mean ratio in WC and in his, in, as it relates to many things, but in, especially as it relates to his favorite um, painter, which is Hokusai, a Japanese painter. You've probably seen the big painting of the wave. Mm. It's actually in my bedroom over there, right on the wall. Um, Debbie C. had that painting above his piano. And that's one painting that, you know, if you're a golden mean person. <laughs> that's a good question, actually. I never thought about that. But, uh, you know, if you look at that painting, you see the curve of the wave. It looks like the conch shell. It's the gold, gold mean ratio is expressed. And how do you see that normally in music? Well, you ask yourself, where is generally the apex of any piece? Where's the climactic moment in any piece? What percentage of the way through? You know, usually... Like Five-eighths. Five-eighths, right? Somewhere around there. So, like, 60-something percent of the way through. And generally, I think as, as a rule, that's typically true. Now you can, you can engineer your form any way you want. You could have the, a lot of pieces of the climax right at the end. You want to end big? Well, it's probably going to be right at the end. But what's a lot less likely? To have it before the 50% mark. That would be extremely unlikely. Right? Because then what happens? Well, what are you going to do with the rest of it? <laughs> you know, I will tell you that one of the hardest pieces I ever wrote myself, the fugue, double fugue movement of my cantata, which is like a palindrome style fugue, so you have two fugues, and the climax is right in the center of the thing, right? So it forms this palindrome. It's seven voice fugue, one through seven to start, climactic moment in the middle, and the second fugue is inverse retrograde, seven back to one. And this, I did it because it seemed to fit the text very well. We should talk about that in greater details next time. Uh, but it was one of the hardest things I ever had to do because, you know, writing the first part up to the Climax was, you know, not that bad. I mean, it's a few, so it's still hard to write, but, like, you could do it. But then writing the back half of it was so difficult. So it's like, why, where's the need for this to keep going if we're on a constant diminuendo and the climax of the piece was 50% of the way through? It's very hard to hold interest for that long span of time, right? So if you think about it from up that formal point of view, if you have a six, let's call it a six-minute prelude and a one-and-a-half-minute fugue, well, still the climax will be at the end of that prelude. And so you're still, if you're looking at the whole thing, pretty much right on point with your golden mean. It's fascinating, right? I gave this example to one of my students the other day. I think it was Roger. He's not here, so I can talk about him. <laughs> uh, you know, you guys all seen the uh, Lord of the Rings movies? Yeah. OK. You know? No. You never heard of it? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, especially if you if you watch like the extended ones, like the whole movie, like all three movies together, is like nine hours mm -hmm. of movie, right? It's insane. Kind of like a random cycle. Yeah, actually. <laughs> I wonder where that came from. Yeah. Um, but I remember, like, when people first saw the last movie, like, one of the big complaints, they're like, God, the ending is, like, 45 minutes long. It's like, it ends, like, so many times. It's like, why does it end so many times? It's like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> That may be true if you're thinking about a three-hour movie. A three-hour movie shouldn't have a 45-minute coda. But a nine-hour movie should have a 45-minute coda. And that's what they had in mind. So I think the form of it was great, to be honest. But you have to look at it the entire picture. The same kind of thing is going on here with this creative computer. So, you know, you'll see a lot of people, especially in the old days of kind of like scholarship before it was scholarship, where people just said stuff and <laughs> made, it, made it think like it was like well-researched. Um, the guy I always pick on for this is, I can't remember his first name, his last name is Toby. Donald Toby? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank you. He produced uh, an edition of the Well-Tempered, I believe it was for Calmus originally, it might have been for Shermer, but one of the two. And it has extensive like notes at the beginning about how to play each prelude and fugue and you know his thoughts about it. You know, he's a sage pianist. And they are so wrong. Like, so <laughs> many times. In his introduction, he actually says there's no evidence of any kind that every prelude and fugue are linked together. It's like you would say you just missed the whole point of the well tempered right there. <laughs> and he says it's like the first paragraph, so you're like, whew. And in this one. Uh, he makes the, the very erroneous decision that if you look at the prelude, you see it starts with 16th notes, moves into 32nd notes in the staccato-like opening, right? Mm -hmm. And then in the fugata that follows, it's all quarter note motion. So he said that everyone at that one point should play double tempo, should increase the tempo by, by you know, double it, by 100%. And then when you get back to the 16th notes in bar 25, you should just go back to the tempo you started. <laughs> like, it seems so asinine, right? But, I mean, it's true that when you play it and you get to the fugato, it feels really slow. 
Anytime you're moving the 16th note pattern, and then look, the accelerates 30 seconds, and all of a sudden, like, those quarter notes are slow. True. But if he had done even the most modicum small amount of research, he would have known that if you look at the original 1722 autograph of the Well Tempered, there's a handwritten note, probably most people think it's by one of the Bach students, saying, don't change the tempo in this prelude. And it says it right there on the autograph, in handwritten, you know, perfect little German, don't change the damn tempo. <laughs> so obviously, even in Bach's time, like, he realized that somebody could do that. But as we know from studying the rest of the Well Tempered, when Bach wants a tempo change, he writes a tempo change. He does it, he does it in the C minor, he does it in many of the prelude. So, in any case, silliness about it. <laughs> So, to get back to the topic of duality, it's fascinating in this prelude to have two sections of music at the beginning, the Toccata and the Fugata, that are so drastically different and force the rest of the prelude to find a way to interact with two. It's a really radical idea, right? This is not a sonata or anything like it, right? The A and B have literally nothing to do with one another. And the lengthiness of this prelude, I think, speaks to the fact that those two things have to be reconciled before one can move forward with the actual fugue. Fascinating, right? All right. Should I, uh, should I play the whole thing through? Sure. The prelude, if you don't mind? Okay. So I could like, play sections and talk through it, but maybe it's just better to hear the whole thing at once. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> it really is like the master of the preludes. Incredible. I mean, it's one of the most complex fugues in the entire world of temper. It's amazing. It's an incredible. <laughs> There's also another aspect that I want to talk about with this, which before we get into the nitty gritty, which uh, which we will. If you think about the A and the B, the, the, let's call it the Takata and the Fugata. It's not really a Takata opening. It's almost more of an invention. It looks like it might be like a three-part invention waiting to happen. Um, but notice what happens to it immediately. Like, as soon as you get to that dominant bar eight, it just kind of implodes. It's like, uh, we're done. <laughs> right? Which is kind of fascinating because it's like once you do something like that in bar eight, bar nine, like, what, you can't keep going with that. Like, if, you, if this were a normal kind of species-style prayer or invention, those bars eight and nine would look like they'd be the very end of the piece. It would look like the, the last thing you do before the cutout, right? But here they are, like right off the bat. It's so bizarre that he, he gets to such a level of like punch bottle density and then just decides, ah, screw it, break the rhythm up, implode the whole damn thing, do it, done. <laughs> and then the Fugato, so, okay, before I even get to that. So this feels, these first nine measures, very, very Baroque, right? Very, very Bachian, high Baroque, late Baroque music. But when the Fugato starts, it doesn't feel so Baroque all of a sudden, does it? It really feels to me more like, an, like a Renaissance imitation style. Um, Fugato. Why, why do I keep saying Fugato and not a fugue? It's not a fugue, the second idea. It's it, because the subject is not exact. Look at measure 10. So it's, first of all, it starts in the stretto. So what's the subject? Looks like that, right? Does everybody do that? Well, the bass... It, and, it's, and it's not imitative in a Baroque style at all, actually. It's much more free imitation that you'd find in a Palestrina type texture, yeah. right? And remember, our kind of overall goal for the whole season here is to talk about how people transcend norms, right? Um, one of the ways that Bach does that oftentimes, and it's usually some of his most profound moments, is when he kind of like imitates a style from the past. And he kind of reaches back to the Renaissance a little bit, or even to the early Baroque, and say like, oh, I'm just going to grab that for a second. <laughs> right, and then see if I can infiltrate the entire thing together. Because of that, you get some of the surprises that we heard. My, I mean, I'll just go through a short list. The cadence from bar 15 to 16 is the first just straight up shocker, isn't it? Uh, that's an amazingly sharp pitch, that's apparently right. It kind of looks like a vocal fugue, right? You can give this to four people and have them sing it. It's the E flat. Yeah, the E natural, that should have been an E flat there. Uh, right. Because they're so set up for the perfect authentic cadence. <laughs> right, but... <laughs> That's an amazing cadence. It's, yeah, it's, so it's like C7. Yeah, exactly. So that and the key that we're supposed to be in would be 5 of, six, five of 2. All right, so it's like, it's not just a normal retrograde cadence where 5 goes back to 4, but 5 goes back to 5 of 4, 5 of 2, <laughs> same thing, right? So, fascinating. Um, and that, to me, starts to set up the contrapuntal motives that we're going to start seeing more on that later. That's a more complicated topic. But okay. But again, that's very, very much in the imitative style of earlier composers. Um, I've been I've been going off. I don't know if you if I've been talking to you. I guess I haven't been talking to you guys about it. But I've been going off about this piece that I heard about a month ago by Carissimi. Uh, mm. This piece that Variant Six did called Yepta. It's this big kind of quasi opera, quasi oratorio thing, mm. circa sixteen forty. Unbelievable character, and dissonant as all hell, just like shockingly dissonant at times. And I just like heard it, I never heard that piece before. And then, you know, Carisi me is not something I think about every day, right? <laughs> but I, I heard the piece live and I was like, oh my god, is that gorgeous. And it really reminds me of stuff like this, mm -hmm. where just little surprises everywhere to just thwart your expectations. Now, Carisi me is writing kind of like what we're talking about in our last lecture. He's writing in a slightly pre tonal time, just slightly. You'll start to see things in the 1640s, like they'll be straight up Neapolitan chords, but whoa, that's tonal music right there, right? And like, they'll really just have, oh wow, that was like really a, and, you know, something you'd expect from a much later time period. But then there'll be these imitative passages like this, where a straight up five chord, well prepared, will just go completely off the rails. Fascinating stuff. So to me, there's a little bit of a nod to that. Um, I also just want to do something. Sometimes I like to do this because, you know, as you can remember, the, the title of this whole cycle always confuses people. The well-tempered clavier. Like, what does he mean by clavier? 
you know. There's a great recording that Robert Levin did, also from Not Jay's Doom, where he mix and matches on the recording between organ, harpsichord, and clavichord, which whichever one he thinks is more appropriate for each prelude and fugue. Which is kind of an interesting thing to look, you know, think about. Because I mean, if Bach wanted this to be an organ piece, he would call it an organ piece. You know? And some of them really feel like they should be organ pieces. Some of them you, you like couldn't imagine. Wait, organ. which you said three different right, instruments. Right, so organ, harpsichord, and clavichord. Yeah. Those would be the three that Bach knew well, and the clavichord being the newest one of those, and like a little more expressive, but not as nimble as the harpsichord, you know. And so, like, if you look at this, there's another one on piano. No, yeah, piano had piano has, has hasn't yet come around. Why not? Right, but but uh, oh yeah, I mean Levin, no, he doesn't do any of them. Yeah, 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 right. Um, so it's interesting recording, you know, because you really hear like, oh, wow, that really does feel like a clavichord piece or like a organ. But this one is very hard to nail down because the Do beginning you know sure looks like a harpsichord. What's that? Do you know which? He doesn't work on this one. And it's funny because like the beginning doesn't really feel like an organ piece, but when you get to this part, oh, it definitely yeah, feels yeah. like an organ piece. <laughs> so since since you can imagine on the organ, here's what I want to do. I want to play from bar twenty, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to play every suspension as if the ties weren't there. See what I mean? Because this is how you're going to hear it on the organ, where everything is sustained. Alright, so I'm going to play, forget all the ties, here we go. And I'm going to play the, de like, what's happening on every beat, every, every beat. So you're starting on the downbeat of 20, which is usually tied? Yes, well. exactly. So, yeah. through measure 21, where you get that amazing kind of 3-9 sound. See the B3 of measure 21? Sol, Re, La, flat, C flat. So that's a, that's a ninth chord, right? I mean, it has played. And here, seventh chord, four seven, five seven, one nine. Now, if you look at enough Bach, you know, like all composers, he has patterns. And if you think about where, in terms of the harmony, right? In, in terms of the tonal sense that you expect in any piece, you go from starting at the tonic, which is neutral and colorless and, you know, ready to be painted on, towards the predominant, eventually arriving at the dominant, and then falling back to the tonic. That's, that's the tonal sense. But here's what's interesting. As you go through music history, you ask yourself, once tonal music begins, how far can you take the predominant before you absolutely just have to break and go to the dominant? How dissonant can you make that predominant before it's like, I just can't, just, I can't take any more distance. I have to go back to five, <laughs> right? Because that's the tension, right? The tension goes up, 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 and then five is the high point of the tension. And then you fall back down, there's nowhere else where to go. Or you go deceptive and turn it around, but is that's that, it. Is that true with dominant too? No, once you've hit the dominant, you're there. Now you can sit on that dominant all day, see Wagner, <laughs> and like, try to like build the tension on it as much as possible. But once you're on the dominant, you have no options. You either go back to tonic, you go somewhere else. you go deceptive, you go somewhere else. Like you can't go more dramatic. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Because you're not in the same part of the tonal sense. So for Bach, in minor, the farthest he goes is the Neapolitan chord. Once you get to the Neapolitan, you can guarantee in Bach that the next chord you will have will be the dominant. 100% assured. 99.5% of shit. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're like, wait, I found an example. Uh, in major, and sometimes in minor as well, the four with the nine and the seven. Right? Because you think about think about that position for a second. So in this, this is the downbeat of bar 23. La, flat, C flat, Do, Sol. If I were to rearrange those pitches in their um, pitch class order, make the smallest pitch class I could do, could do it be this. Four pitches in a row. So I got doublings and spacings being everything in life. When you hear this, we'll see. 
it's funny, the Navi of 22 is the 7th chord, the 4-7. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Navi of 23 is the 9th chord. Oh, yeah. And that is Bach's line. You said it's the 4 chord with a 9? Right, 4 chord with a 9 and a 7. Okay. So that gives you those 4 pitches in a row. A half step and 2 whole steps. Right? When, when people say 9 or 11 or 13, the 7 is usually... Not always, not always. Um, because, for example, look at the beat three of measure 22. When you have the alto suspension, you end up with. Now, because we don't expect a one chord to have a functional seven, if we have one nine, we wouldn't expect a seven. But on a dominant, we'd expect a seven. <coughs> because okay. the dominant seventh is what we expect to have. The ninth, if this is included, would expect the seventh to be on top of it. But the four is like the one that could go either way. Mm -hmm. You could have the four with the nine, with the seven, or either or. Uh, now you can do that with any of these chords, but I'm thinking about what will happen normally in the tonal progression. If you put a, one, a seven on the one, you either have a major seventh chord, which is not functional, or you've made it a dominant seventh, which is it's not a one chord anymore. Now it's a five and four. Right? So, so, but with a dominant, because it has to be dominant seventh with the nine. Uh, sorry, with the seven. The ninth implies the seven. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's, a fun, that's a really good question. I've actually never never explained it that way. That's, that's so you're saying if, if you were to play the dominant chord without the seventh, that it would still be implied? It would still be implied in the harmony, right? In this key, it would sound something like this. It's still, it's still doesn't re, it doesn't remove its dominant function. It's mm -hmm. the seventh chord, right? Now, it's interesting that you, you mentioned that, because he gives you that exact chord coming up and halfway through 23. And it actually, without the seventh, starts to influence the motion towards the dominant as a modulatory chord. Right? So here's 23. Right here. There's a dominant with no seventh, but it does have the ninth. With the C flat flat, right? Right, with the Do still hanging. Do still right in the alto. Oh. And it's tricky to see, right? Because this is why you got to think like an organist. Like, you're still holding on to that finger on that note, right? Uh, and because the seventh isn't there, it starts a modulation. It's like a plagal. It is. It has a plagal. Well, see, you know, I, I mean, I, I gotta do a lecture sometime on Chopin's, like, you know, trying to trick you whether thinking of if you're going four one or one five or one five four. Like he's so good at like distorting the back the back. Well, you were talking about that when you were talking about the shoe. Yeah, it was. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. So it's a similar thing here. It's like when you you ask yourself, like, does this piece, does this passage end in the dominant, or is that the dominant <laughs> you know, to, of the tonic that you're supposed to be in the tonic key? Mm -hmm. Because when you end with this, and if I just take it out of context and play this, you'd be like, well, that's a playable cadence, right? But what if I just do this? That's an authentic cadence in a different key. And so he's he's kind of fooling you. I and mean, that, what that does is it launches the fugato, the actual fugue, nicely, because we immediately don't know which key we're in. We have to wait until the first cadence of the proper key, which is bar 27, to like, make up the minds. How does that work in like normative sonata form, where the B is in the dominant, but you're in that, you're switching keys to the dominant, so it's... It's all about the tonic, cadence. But... It's all about the cadence, you know? Because if, when you're switching keys to the dominant, and you really have a 5-1 cadence in the dominant. When I start in the dominant, I'm good to go. Right? But in this case, the cadence was plagal, and so we're really like not entirely sure we're okay with it, right? We're like, I'm sorry. It's like whatever I play next is gonna be tonic. So if I do this again and I go, that's one. And if I did, that's one. <laughs> and the romantic composers, well, it's Schubert also, were the first to kind of be like, hmm. <laughs> that like leads to so much modulation and uncertainty, which both things are going to accelerate as music history goes on. Right? So let's talk about a few things in the, once the fugue begins. Do you know it's a double fugue? Why? Because the, the, both aspects, the, the motive that was in, inclined in A, which was this, right, and the Subject of B. Now they're going to be treated like actual fugal process, which means you're going to have both subjects be inviolate, right? Which means you can't <coughs> can't be changed. Um, and the additional third and fourth voice around it will be either counter subject material, responding material, or free. It's a long fugue, as as, as you know. I just played it for you. Um, <laughs> notice what was missing in this fugue that 
you would see in a lot of MOOCs, like from a formal point of view. So a week cap, possibly. Mm -hmm. Also, notice there's no episodes, there's no sequences, right? Mm -hmm. It's a true few, which means the subject, or I should say, both subjects are always present. That makes the writing of this few exceptionally difficult, <laughs> right? Because there's no time to break to go back to three voices and give us a sequence or something like that, right? So, <clears throat> the technique I just showed you about modulation, I want to show you exactly how this comes into play as you go through the few, because these are the design elements that give you the desire for this few to keep going and not be static. I want to point to the cadence in G minor bar 35. Let me play from 30. Three. Look where we are right here. Okay, you can hear it. That's the predominant four chord with the seventh and the ninth on it in G, right? And that's exactly where we're going. So. Perfect authentic. We're good. So that was a full cadence, and we were like, okay, now we are in G minor, right? But look who does right immediately. Is sneaky. See, he's giving you a courtesy accidental on the score. Bach very rarely writes courtesy accidentals that are in the manuscript. He writes that A flat in there because he's like, oh, this should definitely be this. Or in G minor. What is that? It's... And what happens when I do that? The modulation just occurred. You just, you know, you blink and you miss it. But you gotta remember, your ears are so much faster and smarter than your brain. Right? But the reason that we study theory the way we do is to try to get our brain to catch up with what our ears can do automatically. So it would be before it was going to G minor. Oh, it did go to G minor. Uh, like it yeah. happened. But then instantaneously, with that second yeah, sixteenth yeah. minute, it's gone. It is one natural. So exactly. So let me play it in context from 34. <laughs> Yes, no. Yeah, no. <laughs> right? You made the full cadence, and then immediately you just, boom, you're back in the home key. No no chord to modulate or anything like that. Just that one pitch is all you needed. So this is where it comes in when we say, like, no episodes, right? So it yes. eases back in. Exactly, because that's where it would have happened, right? You would have had... Episode, sequence, yeah. modulate, right? Mm. That's, that's a normal fugue. That's what would happen here. But since this is a true fugue, a double fugue, there's just so much to deal with with the two subjects that he doesn't feel the need to do that. Now, this technique of making a full cadence and then having a dramatic instantaneous modulation happens over and over and over again. And this is a good technique to use in your own music, trust me. Right? Because I do it all the time. Because, I mean, you know, you think like, oh, well, I'm not going to write a 5-1 in my piece. It's like, well, maybe you won't. But if you did, you know what's one way to do it? Is to do it and then immediately forward it. Right? That's a real psychological effect, which is very powerful. Mm. Right, and people always think, "Well, oh, I will do something so simple." Well, you know, don't think of it as simple. It's just one of our millions of techniques. Right, when you do it, they're gonna immediately just like throw the monkey wrench in it the next second. It's like it's very powerful. It's very jarring, actually. So he does the same thing in bar thirty-eight. So here's a full cadence. It's gonna be an F minor. So. <laughs> Right, the ray, the ray flat will point you towards F minor, right, which is why he gives you that at the beginning of the bar. But then look in the bass at the end of the bar, you get a ray natural, okay. and that immediately shifts it out of that key back into C minor. Right. Can you put it, so you started at thirty-eight. Yeah, let me let me back up one minute just to get the context. Let's do thirty-seven. <laughs> Because it's natural, it's like, oh, wait, that like, can't exist in fall minor, so <coughs> I guess we modulate it. <laughs> Would you maybe count that as one of those um, uh, third continental idiomatic experiments? Yes, I, I mean, this is where we're going with the end of this, right? And you're, you're, you're leaving heads of good stuff, which I appreciate, <laughs> right? The, the, the subjugation of each of these keys is done by flipping one accidentally, right? By just flipping one of them, and that shifts your ear. That's what's going to be our contrarian model as we go on. He did it in both the um, Staccato section and the fugato as well. Like having that E natural in bar 
16 that we talked about that was so bizarre, should have been an E flat, this flipping of them is exactly what he's going to be up to. I'll show you one or two more examples of this. Um, oh, there's a really clear one at the top of the page, 41. You're headed towards the cadence in C minor. <laughs> That's because we just did a full cadence in a very dark key, the relative minor of the home key, the minor. And then immediately the ray flat switches into la flat with four of those very bright flakes. Fascinating. Now, I, wanna, I, I got a puzzle for you guys. I got a puzzle. And this is a tough one. Uh, I want you to look. There's something that happens in bar 43 that is really out of the ordinary. So here's 42. Okay. <laughs> See the eighth notes at the top? That's this little counter subject material. What voice is doing that? I mean, it looks like it, but at the beginning of the bar, <laughs> wasn't the soprano holding the whole note? Um, well, I can tell you, but only because they put in dotted lines. Did they really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, they give you away. Yeah, I know. Well, what, do they, what do they say with those dotted lines? Well, the uh, it goes from the tenor. Aha! Uh, I say, yeah. no, it shouldn't be that way. <laughs> See, this, this is a really fussy thing. Like, it looks like he just left an octave higher than it should have been. In every voice before, it's been this. And now you're hearing... It's like an octave transfer, right? Where the tenor just suddenly became the soprano and then stayed there. So, like, if you were singing this, just four people, this is the moment you're like, wait, what? <laughs> did, did he just pull a fast one on us? Like, did the tenor become the soprano and then everybody just moved down? Like, what happened here? You gotta look at the measure before. So, it looks pretty clear what's happening in the measure before, right? But see the alto with the down stems that are above the soprano? It's fascinating, isn't it? So, the alto is the down stem, it's doing this. <laughs> the alto. And so that means the alto at the beginning of that measure is on top. <clears throat> right? Sneaky, right? So that means the tenor part is what? The tenor part in the measure before it starts on the C. And goes all the way up to that soul. And by the way, that's the subject, right? That makes perfect sense. So what happens is actually, you know, kind of what your dotted lines gave away. The soprano goes all the way down to that C flat and leaps all the way back up into its normal position. Oh. Follow the line from the beginning. It goes with the bass. And it really does leap all the way back up into its normal position. Fascinating, right? That's where this stopped being a vocal piece, if it ever was. Um, but that octave and leap, octave and a fourth leap in one voice. The soprano got all the way down to be a third from the bass with the other two voices above it. Mm. Fascinating what fugues make you do. Wow. You know, <laughs> it's really crazy. Because <laughs> like, you know, you can, this is one of my, my great proofs for the, the, the fact that music is not this two-dimensional thing we're looking at, right? It's how we hear, it's, it's in space. And so on the page, you just look at that bar and you're like, well, B flat and the top is a soprano, right? That's what it looks like. No, it's not, that's the alto. Right? Follow the lines. And it speaks to a larger point that, like, one of the great things about fugue writing, if, if anybody who's written one, you, you know this right away, it's like it just forces you to do things that you would not never have thought of before. Because you have all these cantus firmus, right? You have all these things that's like, well, I have to have them do that. So then I'm not going to have my soprano just stop. It has to keep going. It has to keep the motion going. But it's, there's no contrapuntal way to keep it in its right register. What do you do? You innovate. It's particularly confusing because that C flat is a... Uh... Oh. oh, exactly, exactly. So really, because on the piano, you're like, it's going, but now it's actually being held. It's fascinating. That's one of those moments that it took me literally years to figure that out, trust me. I played this piece in my, my entire life, and I always was like, I have no idea what's going on in that bar. And, so, <laughs> and then I like, wait, it's like, no, listen to the lines, play the lines. So, um, skipping ahead a little bit, the... Where's the climatic moment of this entire double fugue? I would say it's at 64. I want to play into that. 
see the base entrance at 61. Usually when the final base entrance comes in and it's in the home key, it's like you know you're headed to the finish line, right? Okay, so here's the base entrance halfway through 50, sorry, 61. <laughs> Same exact chord, different space. So downbeat of 64, you compare with downbeat of 23. Same exact chord, richer space. First time here. Second time here. And from that point on, you should know piece is done. We're gonna go to the dominant. We're gonna we're gonna have a cut. That's your climactic point. So Everything from there on is, is coded. So the G is an octave up and the or the G is an octave down. And the key is exactly. An octave it's like they've switched, right? And so it's even more dissonant than it was the first time. I think the first time this one dissonant, but it's you know, light dissonant. This one. <laughs> That's strong. And because they're in a different position, something funny happens. Always don't you know, I just said don't trust your eyes, but here, here's one time when you should. Like, you look later in that same bar, look at the bass. It leaps down a tritone. That's weird. Sixteenth note for that low ray, natural, and then again, the whole thing just leaps up an octave and you forget about it? Hmm. Hmm. Question that must be answered. <laughs> yeah, this is what that screams to me. And Okay, we'll hold off on that for a second, but leave that as something that, you know, is unanswered. From that point on, we're in coda territory, right? This looks like the last dominant, and it is, but he has one more surprise in store for you. Showing you this is this is the idea that's been playing with the entire time. Mm -hmm. The only, you know how, I, how, how careful I how carefully I use this word. The only thing that's unresolved is that low ray that he left away from. Mm -hmm. it never got never got picked up. Mm -hmm. Never went back down. Mm -hmm. And so when all the haters of the fugue that's about to follow this say like, "Well, you don't really need that fugue because like you just had the greatest fugue ever," it's like, "Well, yeah, you do. Because you need to go pick up that low pitch." It's not done. So this piece ends like this. <laughs> not done yet. <laughs> you can be sure he's gonna he's gonna rectify that in the future. Proper. So should we play that? Sure. You're gonna forgive my um so the ray is trying to go in the flat. It has to, right? It's leading time hanging below, it's so trying to go up. Um, can you play it from like uh, sixty three or something? Sure. Um, here's 
So Maybe let's hack to that. You will. That's so good. He's so just aware of what he's doing. Yeah. All right, here's the fugue. Forgive my little mistakes. <laughs> Subject uh, in well, it's not really a counter subject. We'll call it the free counterpoint bar five, left hand. All right, so you just did, and then third voice in the next measure. Right. <laughs> you hear it everywhere. Probably the most. I mean, it's it's everywhere. I could show you a million examples. Mm -hmm. But my favorite, a really unique passage in Bach, um, measure 14, 15, 16, 17. He kind of goes off the radar here. There's no subject present, and it's not a sequence. It's a very bizarre passage right here. So this is halfway through bar 14. <laughs> beats in the right hand. <laughs> Except for the right flat at the very end, he's giving you the whole thing. Uh, That's a fascinating passage of music. I mean, because you look at it, you're like, you know, this is, there's, there are real episode sequences in this, right? And you're like, okay, well, this could have been that. But no, this is like a free passage of music with no subject. So what's the point? You know? Like, in a few of you, are either doing a middle entry, which includes the subject, or you're doing an episode, which is the sequence. There's nothing else, right? In Bach, there is nothing else, except once in a while, you get a weirdo passage like this. And you're like, why is he doing this passage? It's to show you the full-on chromatic line. 
We're going to tie rock with some go to go. If I play this as triads, <laughs> look at this one, this is good. Here we go. Uh, I'm starting halfway through 14. stoppage of motion all of a sudden. Oh, by the way, I should say, when did the E flat finally get picked up? It took a long time, but we got there. Bar 24? That's right, 24. All right, after all of this time, finally that low E flat gets picked up. Like the, the ray to the E flat. Now, look at the coda. Here's the last thing I want to say. Um, so I'm going to play last entrance. Let's go from um, 33, slowly. <laughs> That's what he's been doing the whole time. All three voices at the same time, chrome and half step. In isolation, right? Meaning like, he just stopped the whole, the whole motion. He was like, there's the motives. You haven't figured it out already. <laughs> and then we finish. Cadence got so adapted by other things, it's like that's how we think of it now. But at the time period, you have to think like this is insanely complex. You know, to have the equivalent of you're landed on a one chord, but inside the pedal you have five of four going to a major four, going to a minor four, which transforms into a seven, and then boom, time. <laughs> we take it for granted now because we've heard those sounds so many times. But think about how revolutionary this would have been, 1722. Wow. So. Anyway, the whole goal of this today was to show you how these dualities can, like these large form dualities, can then come and be seen on a small level as well. We saw like the kind of Baroque Renaissance duality at the beginning. We saw the, the actual formal duality of the opening prelude being a double fugue, and then the actual really small duality of this chroma pitch, right, of just the D natural D flat or the A natural A flat. And you see this on all these different levels. When all, all combines, then your form is working with your materials. Everything's working. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like everything is in dialogue with everything else. There's nothing random. That's kind of a, a, a question I wanted to ask, but I guess it kind of answered it in a way. It's like, when we talk about unity in music, yeah. I guess the question ultimately is like, why unity? Mm, like what, question. yeah, I mean, what's, um, if there's all this stuff happening at the micro level, yeah, that obviously works, it's like, why do it? Yeah, why do it? <laughs> Especially if no one's going to notice it. You know? well, what, what effect does it have like, psychologically? You know? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I, I got a couple of answers for that. One, one would just be to go back to that idea of what a contrapuntal motive is. How, if, if the contrapuntal motive is consistent, it's like the, the, the building being built out of one material. You never notice the, the material, you just notice the building. Right. You don't notice the bricks, you just notice what the bricks are making. It's like the surface of a hole. Basically. Exactly. Okay. I think that's one aspect of it. I think you could do one, you could go one step further if you want to do the, the kind of historical musicological, musicological answer, yeah. which would be, this is the first time period in music where we're breaking away from vocal music and texted music for good, mm -hmm. right? Where this is becoming what will be the age of the piano about 100 years later, mm -hmm. right? And, and for the first time, that means there's no text, which means there's no story, which means you've got to provide your own story, mm -hmm. right? Like, these are not narrative structures anymore. 
like the music, this is music for music's sake, for the very first time. And it's not like Bach's the first person to ever write a solo piano piece, that's not what I'm saying, but well, not a piano piece, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, but you have to make your own logic out of it. You're not just setting text, so you're not just following whatever the hymn says you're supposed to do, whatever the religious text is that you're following in the Renaissance. And they were consciously doing this, not oh. breaking away from it. Oh, yeah. He can't stand on his own. Definitely. Okay. Especially as these, this, like these keyboard instruments became closer and closer to the modern capacity of what we can do with the piano. Right? I mean, the organ was kind of already there. It wasn't fully there, but it was pretty close. Uh, this, and so, you know, the virtuosity goes like hand in hand with that. But you have to make, you have to find a way to make your own sense out of this, you know, out of this otherwise chaotic world. I guess, I guess also like for postmodern ears, we've seen that we can juxtapose anything and we can thanks to the wonders of free association, make connections between even the most disparate elements. Certainly. But I guess there's always a line, like what point does it just become like an intellectual? But that, that's, that's your philosophical constraint. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, the whole 20th that's century was trying to figure that out uh, in many ways, you know, if you want to broad brush it. You know, because once things like tonal system were ignored and other things like this, you don't have all of this background of conversation to, to play with. And you have to invent your own language and your own, like, you know, this versus this. Like early modernism is what is what that really is, right? Like Stravinsky and modern modernism, meaning just the juxtaposition of two things which cannot necessarily not at all be from the same source, right? Right. But then postmodernism, when we're like, okay, we got tired of that, yeah. so it's like now we're in that weird world where it's like, okay, how far can you stretch the connection before it just becomes nonsense? Before nobody else hears it, but you. Yeah. And before you maybe you don't hear it either. You know? yeah. And that's the place we all find ourselves in when we try to make our own styles these days. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting question. If it's not comprehensible to anyone like, at large, then I feel like the value is drops a lot. Yeah. It's my personal opinion. But uh, you know, can, can, if you can't connect with an, with an audience, then I don't know what the point is. Uh, and that can, point of connection can be all, all kinds of different things. I'm not saying make them happy. You know, it can be whatever it is. For all the men. Right. I mean, if they're not in, then it's like, why are you doing this? Yeah. Now, tonal music has the added advantage of being what naturally works in our ears and what we've grown up with. Whether it's nature or nurture, I'll leave that argument for another day. <laughs> but like, you know, it has billions of connotations that are just present throughout. If you use that system, you have to be aware of those connotations. You know, and if you don't, you have to make them somehow in other ways. So do you think if like the the general like um, that people had this longing towards understanding and feeling like good about the knowledge that they've learned, like if that wasn't true, then music would be like completely different. Oh yeah, I think that's totally true. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that idea a lot because I mean, you know, and, and again, it's not. I think whenever people talk about it, it's like you just assume that that means people feel positive. It doesn't mean they can feel really negative about it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. But as long as they feel something, you, know, you get you, you. Music at its very core is about sharing an idea. It's a social construct. Right? It's like I'm producing something that you can get something from, and the idea is mine. There are all these things that are in place where they. Exactly, yeah, exactly. But like the the idea of like it being it having meaning and it's like inherent form is what this time period's really all about. Right? Meaning we've taken away the singers, we've taken away the text, it's not about the church. It's this is this is music for music's sake. Like what can what can you do with that? And you know, Bach is the first master of that. Probably the greatest obviously, but um, this sets the stage for all the music that we know now. Yeah, and when you think about it. Good questions. Good questions. Um, uh, yeah. Um, how does the uh, bar uh, twenty four um, the the E flat? How did uh, you said that that's the time that it in the few? Yeah. Um, yeah. That that's you said that that's the time that the, the ray resolves. Right. But there's. Like so much music. Thirty bars. <laughs> random, but they're not random. Not, yeah, there's no. a resolution. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I know. And it's funny because you know, in the Shankarian way, you would have said, "Well, this this resolves right at the beginning." As soon as we're back, and he, well, he would have said it resolves at the end of the of the prayer itself, mm -hmm. because we have the large scale of three, three, two, one, et cetera, et cetera. But to me, register really matters. And you know, if you think about it on the keyboard, box keyboard is do to do, right? Oops, so that's me. Um, yeah. So the so the ray here is incredibly low on the instrument, right? and it's it's arrived at especially at that moment in a forte moment, left away from it and abandoned. So even though you're right that the, the the first half of this entire prelude takes place much higher, 
like we're just still our ears are waiting, waiting, waiting to get back down there. Mm. And now when we do, so I feel the register because of the register. And nothing else has gone down there. Not even close, right? And it's funny because at the end of the piece, he finally just hangs out in the low register for a while, right? From thirty, oh, yeah. and to there, there is the the E flat at the very end, exactly. That's really nice. If he had ended this high, it would have been a little disappointing. It's really nice to finally be. Like, and that last little passage, I love when he throws you like the raucous bass line. Right, like 32, where you go. Like, yeah. It's just so much fun, you know. It's like that's where you've been wanting to hang out for a long time. So, yeah, those long distance connections are really important to, me, to hearing you know, large scale playing with keys. So, excellent. Well, thank you guys. Good fun. Gotcha. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, yeah, see you next time. Thank you for.